The Discourses of Christ of the Last Days. Only resolving one's corrupt disposition can bring about true transformation. Say someone paints a painting. They think it is perfect and they are satisfied until one day someone says that their painting has a lot of flaws. Before that person even gets into the details, they feel that this constitutes an attack on them. They feel upset and immediately counter with, you say I don't paint well? You paint worse than me and your works have more problems. No one even wants to look at them. Why are they able to say such a thing? What sort of state are they in to be able to say such a thing? Why is such a small thing able to make them so angry and furious and give rise to a retaliatory, aggressive mindset? What led to this? They think their painting is perfect and someone else saying that it has flaws offends them. It's that you cannot damage their perfect image. If they think something is good, you had best not point out any blemishes or bring up any doubts. You must say, Your painting is really good. It could be called a masterpiece. I don't think the skills of even the great masters are any better than yours. If you release this piece, it will certainly make a stir in the industry and be a prized possession for generations. Then they will be pleased. The pleasure and fury are from the same person. So how is it they have two different revelations? Which one is their corrupt disposition? They both are. Which of these corrupt dispositions is more severe? The second one. The second one reveals their hypocrisy, ignorance, and foolishness. When someone says that you paint badly, why are you so unhappy, to the point that you develop a hateful, aggressive, retaliatory mindset? Why are you so pleased when someone strings together a few nice words for you? Why are you so extremely smug? Are such people not totally shameless? They know no shame. They are both foolish and pitiful. Although these words do not sound very nice, this is nevertheless the case. Where do people's ignorance, foolishness, and ugly countenances come from? They come from people's corrupt dispositions. If someone has such an attitude when things like this happen, the things they reveal are not the reason and conscience that someone with normal humanity ought to possess, nor are they what someone with normal humanity ought to be living out. Then how should matters like this be dealt with? Some people say, I have a way. When someone else boasts that I am good, I am silent. When someone says that I am bad, I am also silent. I deal with everything in a cold way. This does not involve being right or wrong, nor is it a revelation of a corrupt disposition. Isn't it great? How is this viewpoint? Does this mean that these people do not have a corrupt disposition? No matter how good someone is at pretending, even if they can do it for a while, doing it for a lifetime is not easy. However good you are at pretending, or however tightly you cover things up, you cannot disguise or cover up your corrupt disposition. You might be able to deceive people about what is in your heart, but you cannot deceive God, nor can you deceive yourself. Regardless of whether or not it is revealed, in the end, what a person thinks of and what arises in their mind whether intense or not, whether apparent or not, represents their corrupt disposition. 
So are these corrupt dispositions not naturally revealed anywhere and at any time? Some people think that they might let a remark slip sometimes when they are not careful, exposing their innermost thoughts, and they regret it. They think, Next time I won't say anything. He who talks a lot errs a lot. If I don't say anything, then my corrupt disposition won't be revealed, right? In the end, however, when they act, their corrupt dispositions are revealed once again, and they once again expose their intents, which can happen anywhere and at any time, and is impossible to guard against. So, if your corrupt disposition is not resolved, it is normal for that corrupt disposition to be regularly revealed. There is only one way to resolve it, which is that you must seek the truth and put forth some effort until you really understand the truth and are able to see through to the essence of your corrupt disposition. Then you will be able to hate Satan and your flesh, and in this way, it will be easy for you to put the truth into practice. When you are able to put the truth into practice, what you reveal will not be a corrupt disposition, but rather revelations of conscience, reason, and normal humanity. So, only by seeking the truth can you resolve the problem of a corrupt disposition. Relying on self-control, restraint, and self-discipline is not a good method and cannot resolve a corrupt disposition at all. So how do you resolve corrupt dispositions? First, you must recognize and dissect the origin of these corrupt dispositions, then find the corresponding method of practice. Take the example I just gave. This person thinks that their painting is perfect, but in the end, someone who understands painting says that it has many flaws, so they are not happy and feel that their self-esteem has been injured. When your self-esteem is injured and when your corrupt disposition is revealed, what can be done? Other people put forth different ideas and perspectives so what can be done when you cannot accept them? Some people are incapable of handling this correctly. When something happens to them, they first analyze it. What do they mean by that? Are they directing it at me? Is it because I gave them a nasty look yesterday? So today they want to retaliate against me? If they're directing that at me, then I won't just let it drop. A tooth for a tooth, an eye for an eye. If they will not be kind to me, then I will not be just to them. I must retaliate. What kind of revelation is this? It is still the revelation of a corrupt disposition. In practice, this kind of revelation of a corrupt disposition shows an inclination and intent to retaliate. In essence, what is the character of this course of action? Is it not malicious? There is a malicious nature contained therein. Would people retaliate if they did not have a malicious nature? They would not think of it. Only when thinking of retaliation does this kind of language pour out of them? You say, I don't paint well? You paint worse than me, and your works have more problems. No one even wants to look at them. What is the character of such speech? It is a kind of attack. What do you think of such a course of action? Are attacking and retaliating positive or negative? Are they commendatory or derogatory? Clearly, they are negative and derogatory. Attack and retaliation is one type of action and revelation which comes from a malicious, satanic nature. It is also a kind of corrupt disposition. 
people think like this. If you are unkind to me, I'll do wrong to you. If you don't treat me with dignity, why would I treat you with dignity? What sort of thinking is this? Is it not a retaliatory way of thinking? In the views of an ordinary person, is this not a valid perspective? Does it not hold water? I will not attack unless I am attacked. If I am attacked, I will certainly counterattack. And here's a taste of your own medicine. The unbelievers often say such things. Among them, these are all rationales that hold water and completely conform to human notions. Yet how should those who believe in God and pursue the truth view these words? Are these ideas correct? Why are they not correct? How should they be discerned? Where do these things originate? They originate from Satan. Of this there is no doubt. Which of Satan's dispositions do they come from? They come from the malicious nature of Satan. They contain venom, and they contain the true face of Satan in all its maliciousness and ugliness. They contain this kind of nature essence. What is the character of the perspectives, thoughts, revelations, speech, and even actions that contain that kind of nature essence. Without any doubt, it is man's corrupt disposition. It is the disposition of Satan. Are these satanic things in line with God's words? Are they in line with the truth? Do they have a basis in God's words? Are they the actions that followers of God should do and the thoughts and points of view that they should possess. Are these thoughts and courses of action in line with the truth? Seeing as these things are not in line with the truth, are they in line with the conscience and reason of normal humanity? Now you can clearly see that these things are not in line with the truth or with normal humanity. Did you previously think that these courses of action and thoughts were appropriate, presentable, and had a leg to stand on? These satanic thoughts and theories take a dominant position in people's hearts, guiding their thoughts, viewpoints, conduct, and courses of action, as well as their various states. So can people understand the truth? Absolutely not. On the contrary, do people not practice and hold to the things they think are right as if they were the truth? If these things are the truth, then why does sticking to them not resolve your practical problems? Why does sticking to them not produce a true change in you, despite you having believed in God for years? Why are you unable to use God's words to discern these philosophies which come from Satan? Do you still hold to these satanic philosophies as if they were the truth? If you truly have discernment, then have you not found the root of the problems? Because what you were holding to was never the truth. Rather, it was satanic fallacies and philosophies that is where the problem lies. You all should follow this path to examine and scrutinize yourselves. See which things within you are those that you think have a leg to stand on, that are in line with common sense and worldly wisdom, that you think you can put on the table. The incorrect thoughts, viewpoints, courses of action, and foundations that you have already treated as the truth in your heart which you do not think are corrupt dispositions. Keep digging for these things. There are many more. If you dig up all these corrupt and negative things, dissect them until you have discernment and are able to give them up, then your corrupt dispositions will be easily resolved and you will be able to be cleansed.
Let's go back to the example from before. When the painter hears others' assessments of their work, both negative and pleasant, what sort of response is the correct one? With behavior and outpourings that have both humanity and rationality. I just said that those thoughts within people, whether they think they are right or wrong, all come from Satan, from their corrupt disposition. They are incorrect and are not the truth. However rightly you think, or however much you think others approve of your thoughts, they do not come from the truth. They are not the revelations or the living out of the truth reality, and they are not in line with God's will. So how should you actually treat this matter with rationality and humanity? First of all, do not have smug feelings about the words of praise others give you. That is one kind of state. Additionally, do not be averse to or loathe the bad things others say about you, much less have a malicious or retaliatory mentality. Whether they are praising you or not, or saying bad things about you, you must have a correct attitude in your heart. What kind of attitude? First off, you must keep calm. Then say to them, Painting is just an amateur hobby for me. I know my skill level. Regardless of what you say, I can treat you correctly. Let's not discuss painting. I'm not interested in it. What I am interested in is if you can tell me where I have revelations of corrupt dispositions that I have not yet realized that I am unaware of. Let's fellowship and investigate these matters. Let's both experience growth in our life entry and have deeper entry. That would be so great. What use is it to discuss external matters? That cannot help a person do their duty well. Whether you say my painting is good or bad, I don't really care. If you praise my painting, might you not have an ulterior motive? Might you not want to use me to do something for you? If you want me to help you handle a matter, I will help with what I can, free of charge. If I can't help, I can give you some suggestions. There is no need to interact with me in this way. It's hypocritical and makes me feel disgusted and nauseated. If you say my painting is bad, are you trying to tempt me and make me fall into temptation? Do you want me to show my hot-headedness and then to retaliate and attack you? That I will not do. I am not so stupid. I will not be tricked by Satan. What do you think of such an attitude? What is this course of action called? It is called striking back at Satan. Some people who do not pursue the truth have nothing to do and say all kinds of useless words. Ah, your old career was so prosperous, it's enough to make someone jealous. Ah, look at how beautiful you are. Your face is the epitome of good fortune. They look to see who is powerful, who has the looks, or who could be of some use to them, and then stick close to them constantly, flatter them, praise them, and fawn on them. They use all kinds of despicable, shameless methods to satisfy their own unmentionable intents and desires. Is this not disgusting? So how should you treat this kind of person when you run into them? Is it right to go a tooth for a tooth, an eye for an eye? If you have no time, just say a few harsh words to strike back and shame them. You can say, How are you so boring? Do you not have any matters to attend to? What use is it to gossip about such things? If you think that their flattering words are too superficial and nauseating, you do not like to listen, 
and you do not have the time to speak at length, then reply with these few sentences and be done. If you have time, then fellowship with them. Speaking of fellowship, here there is no corrupt disposition, no hot-headedness or naturalness, no attacking or retaliation, no hate, and not a thing that people detest. The things that you reveal must be in line with normal humanity, must be in line with conscience and reason, must have the truth reality, must be able to help others, and must be constructive and beneficial to others. All these things are positive revelations. So, what are some negative revelations? Try to summarize them. Retaliation, attacking, going tooth for tooth, an eye for an eye, and the ideas that people traditionally think are correct. Here's a taste of your own medicine. And, I want to be an upright gentleman. I don't want to be a despicable person or a hypocrite. Are these things people think are right in line with the truth? These things are worth probing. Those things which are simple, clear, and easy to see at a glance are a bit easier to discern. As to the things that the majority of people cannot see, which many people think are right and good, people do not discern them. So it is easy for them to treat and keep to them as if they were the truth. In keeping to them, people think that what they are living out is the truth reality and normal humanity. They think of how perfect, how good, how just and honorable, how open and above board they are. Living out and replacing the truth with those things which are hot-headed, natural, fleshly, ethical, and moral, as if they were the reality of the truth, is a mistake that the majority of people are prone to committing, such that even those who have believed in God for many years are unable to discern it. Almost everyone who believes in God must go through this phase, and only those who pursue the truth are able to escape this mistaken idea. So, people must recognize and probe deep into these things which come from hot-headedness and from naturalness. If you can see through and resolve these things, some of the things that you ordinarily reveal will be in line with the truth reality. Practicing the truth can be achieved with normal humanity. Practicing the truth is the only standard which proves that someone has conscience and reason. No matter how much of the truth they practice, it is all positive. It is absolutely not a corrupt disposition, much less acting with hot-headedness. If someone has hurt you before, and you treat them the same way, is this in line with the truth principles? If, because they hurt you, hurt you very badly, you try by fair means or foul to retaliate against and punish them. According to the unbelievers, this is fair and reasonable, and there is nothing to criticize. But what kind of a course of action is this? This is hot-headedness. They hurt you. Which course of action is the revelation of a corrupt satanic nature? But if you retaliate against them, is your course of action not the same as theirs? The mentality, starting point, and source behind your retaliation are the same as theirs. There is no difference. So, the character of your actions is certainly hot-headed, natural, and satanic. Seeing as it is satanic and hot-headed, should you not change this course of action of yours? Should the source, intents, and motivations behind your actions change? How do you change them? If what happens to you is something small, although it makes you uncomfortable, when it does not touch on your own interests, or hurt you badly, 
or cause you to hate it, or make you risk your life to retaliate, then you can lay down your hatred without relying on hot-headedness. Rather, you can rely on your rationality and humanity to properly and calmly handle this matter. You can frankly and sincerely explain this matter to your counterpart and resolve your hatred. But if this hatred is too deep, such that you get to the point of wanting retaliation and feeling bitter hatred, then can you still exercise patience? When you are able to not rely on hot-headedness and can calmly say, I must be rational, I must live by my conscience and reason and live by the truth principles. I cannot respond to evil with evil. I must stand firm in my testimony and shame Satan. Is this not a different state? What kinds of states have you had in the past? If someone else steals something of yours or eats something of yours, this does not amount to some great, deep hatred. So you will not think it necessary to go argue with them until you are red in the face because of this matter. It is beneath you and not worth it. In this kind of situation, you can handle the matter rationally. Is being able to handle the matter rationally equivalent to practicing the truth? Is it equivalent to having the truth reality in this matter? Absolutely not. Rationality and practicing the truth are two separate things. If you encounter something that makes you particularly furious, but you are able to rationally and calmly deal with it, without revealing hot-headedness or corruption, this requires you to understand the truth principles and rely on wisdom to deal with it. In such a situation, if you do not pray to God or seek the truth, hot-headedness will easily arise in you, even violence. If you do not seek the truth, only adopting human methods and dealing with the matter according to your own preferences, then you cannot resolve it by preaching a little doctrine or sitting down and laying your heart bare. It is not that simple. Right now, what we are fellowshipping about all touches on the problem of people's corrupt dispositions and corrupt natures. Some people are born with a simple, straightforward temperament. When others cause losses to their interests or say something unpleasant to them, they laugh it off and let it pass. Some people are petty and cannot let it pass, bearing a grudge all their lives. Which of these two kinds of people has a corrupt disposition? Actually, they both do, it's just that their natural temperament is different. Temperament cannot influence a person's corrupt disposition, nor does temperament determine the depth of their corrupt disposition. People's upbringing, education, and family circumstances do not determine the depth of their corrupt disposition. So is it related to the things people study? Some people say, I studied literature and have read many books. I have good taste and am cultured, so my ability to self-restrain is stronger than others. My understanding of people is greater than others, and my mind is broader than others. When I encounter things, I have a way to resolve them, so my corrupt disposition might not be so deep. Some people say, I studied music, so I am a special talent. Music uplifts people's souls and purifies their souls. As each note impacts a person's soul, their soul is purified and transformed. Listening to different music puts people in different states of mind and gives rise to different moods. When I am in a negative mood, I listen to music to resolve it so my corrupt disposition 
gradually weakens as I listen to music. My corrupt nature is also gradually resolved as my musical ability improves. Some people who sing say, pleasant songs can bring happiness to people's souls. The more I sing, the more splendid my voice becomes, the greater my singing skill becomes, and the more professional I become, which then improves my state. As my state becomes better and better, will my corrupt disposition not become smaller and smaller? Do you think it is this way? No. So, many people have mistaken ideas in their knowledge and understanding of corrupt dispositions. When they have received a little education, they think their corrupt disposition is reduced. Some older people even think, when I was young, I suffered a lot and life was very simple. I focused on saving and not wasting. Whatever job I did, I was clean as a whistle and my speech was courteous. I spoke frankly and was a guileless person. So, I don't have that many corrupt dispositions. Some young people are influenced by their social environment. They take drugs and they pursue evil trends. They are severely infected by the social atmosphere and are deeply corrupted. These fallacious understandings and knowledge of corrupt dispositions cause people to have different feelings and biases regarding their corrupt essence and satanic nature. These feelings and biases make the majority of people feel that although they have a corrupt disposition, although they are arrogant, self-righteous, and rebellious, the majority of their behavior is still good. In particular, when people are able to observe the rules, have normal regulated spiritual lives, and can speak some spiritual doctrine, then they are even more convinced that they have achievements in the path of believing in God, and that their corrupt disposition has largely been resolved. There are even some people who, when their state is not too bad, when they have achievements in doing their duty, or when they accomplish something, think that they are already spiritual, that they are holy people who have already been perfected and cleansed, and that they no longer have a corrupt disposition. Are such thoughts of people not the various misconceptions that arise under the circumstances of not truly knowing their own corrupt satanic dispositions? Are these misconceptions not the greatest obstacle to people resolving their corrupt dispositions and difficulties? This is the greatest obstacle, the thing that makes people most difficult to deal with. Do you understand what we have fellowshiped about today? Have you grasped the key elements? If people's corrupt dispositions are not resolved, they cannot enter into the truth reality. If they do not know which corrupt dispositions they have, or what their own satanic nature essence is, then are they able to truly admit that they themselves are corrupt humans? If people are unable to truly admit that they are satanic, that they are members of the corrupt human race, then can they truly repent? If they cannot truly repent, then might they not often think that they are not so bad, that they are dignified, high in station, that they have status and honor? Might they not often have such thoughts and states? So why do these states appear? It all comes down to one sentence. If people's corrupt dispositions are not resolved, then their hearts are always disturbed, and it is difficult for them to have a normal state. That is to say, if your corrupt disposition is not resolved in some aspect, it is very difficult for you to be free of the influence of a negative state, 
and very difficult for you to walk out of that negative state, such that you might even think that this state of yours is right, correct, and in line with the truth. You will hold to it and persist in it, and naturally become trapped in it, so it will be very difficult to walk out of it. Then, one day, once you understand the truth, you will realize that this kind of state leads you to misunderstand and resist God, and leads you into conflict with and judgment of God, to the point that you doubt God's words are the truth, doubt God's work, doubt that God is sovereign over all, and doubt that God is the reality and origin of all positive things. You will see that your state is very dangerous. This severe consequence was brought about because you did not truly have knowledge of these satanic philosophies, ideas, and theories. Only at this time will you be able to see how sinister and malicious Satan is. Satan is quite capable of misleading and corrupting people, causing them to take the path of resisting God and betraying Him. If corrupt dispositions are not resolved, the consequences are severe. If you are capable of having this knowledge, this realization, it is entirely the result of you understanding the truth and of God's words enlightening and illuminating you. People who do not understand the truth cannot see through how Satan corrupts people, how it misleads people and makes them resist God. This consequence is especially dangerous. As people experience God's work, if they do not know how to self-reflect, discern negative things, or discern satanic philosophies, then they have no way to be free of Satan's misleading and corruption. Why does God require people to read more of His words? It is so that people will understand the truth, come to know themselves, see clearly what gives rise to their corrupt states, and see where their ideas, viewpoints, and methods of speaking behaving, and dealing with matters come from. When you become aware that these viewpoints to which you hold are not in line with the truth, that they are in conflict with all that God has said, and that they are not what He wants, when God has requirements of you, when His words come upon you, and when your state and mentality do not allow you to submit to God, nor be submissive to the circumstances He has arranged, nor cause you to live free and liberated in the presence of God and satisfy Him. This all proves that the state to which you hold is wrong. Have you run into this kind of situation before? You live by the things that you think are positive, that you think are the most useful to you. But unexpectedly, when things happen to you, the things that you think are most correct often have no positive effect. On the contrary, they cause you to have doubts about God, leave you without a path, give you misunderstandings about God, and give rise to conflict with God. Have you had such times? Of course, you would certainly not hold to those things you think are wrong you only keep holding to and persisting in the things you think are right, always living in such a state. When one day you understand the truth, only then do you realize that the things you hold to are not positive. They are totally erroneous, things that people think are good, but which are not the truth. How much of the time do you realize and become aware that the things you hold to are wrong. If you are aware that they are wrong the majority of the time, but you do not reflect, and you have conflict in your heart, are unable to accept the truth, are unable to correctly face these things, and you also reason on your own behalf, 
If this kind of erroneous state is not turned around, it is very dangerous. Always holding to such things makes it very easy for you to come to grief, easy for you to stumble and fail, and additionally, you will not enter into the truth reality. When people always argue on their own behalf, it is rebellion. It means that they have no reason. Even if they do not say anything out loud, if they hold it in their hearts, then the root problem still has not been resolved. So at what times are you capable of not coming into conflict with God? You must turn your state around and resolve the roots of your problems in this regard. You must be clear on where exactly the mistake is in the viewpoint you hold to. You must probe at this and seek the truth to resolve it. Only then can you live in the right state. When you live in the right state, you will have no misunderstandings about God and you will not have any conflict with Him, much less will notions arise in you. At this time, your rebelliousness in this regard will be resolved. When it is resolved, and you know how to act in line with God's will, will your actions at this time not be compatible with God? If you are compatible with God in this matter, then will all you do not be in line with His will? Our courses of action and practice that are in line with the will of God, not in line with the truth. As you stand firm in this matter, you are living in the right state. When you live in the right state, that which you reveal and live out is no longer a corrupt disposition. You are able to live out normal humanity. It is easy for you to put the truth into practice and you are truly submissive. Right now, the experience of the majority of you has not yet reached this point. So maybe you do not understand God's words very well, and your understanding of them is unclear. You can accept them in theory, and it seems as though you understand, but also as though you do not understand. The part you understand is the doctrine, and the part you do not understand is the part about states and reality. As your experience deepens, you will come to understand these words, and you will know how to put them into practice. Right now, regardless of the depth of your experience, the difficulties you have in the various things that happen to you are certainly not few. So how can you resolve these difficulties? First, you must reflect on the corrupt states that you should probe into. What different aspects are there? Who would like to try describing these? It includes five such aspects. Ideas, viewpoints, conditions, moods, and standpoints. Once you understand the doctrine, then how should you practice and experience when things happen to you? When something happens, we should go examine what disposition and nature the attitudes and ideas that pour out of us pertain to. Come to know these mentalities, ideas, and viewpoints. Then start to resolve them from here. This is right. If you thoroughly know your own true states, attitudes, ideas, and viewpoints, then this problem is already half solved, and then by seeking the truth and putting it into practice, the difficulty is gone. 